Welcome to the RICO 12 Speaker Meeting Podcast. My name is Justin and I am an addict and thanks to my God, the steps and the fellowship of other addicts, I am sober one day at a time since June 19th, 2015. And for that, I am beyond grateful. Welcome once again to the RICO 12 Speaker Meeting. Uh, we are an organization whose addictions include alcohol, drugs, lust and sex, food and gambling, just to name a few. We come together from all places, faiths and backgrounds to learn the similarities of addiction and to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share their experience, strength, and hope on a live Zoom meeting each Friday at noon central time for about 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience, get the opportunity to ask questions of the speaker for another 20 to 25 minutes. In order to ask questions, if you're here live, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you are hearing this podcast recorded and would like to participate as a live audience member, or if you'd even like to be a guest speaker in a future meeting, please go to www.rico12.com, R-E-C-O-1-2, dot com to learn more and submit your email address there to receive weekly invitations or to submit to become a guest speaker. RICO 12 is self-supporting service, and we appreciate your help in keeping it that way. We gratefully accept contributions to help cover the costs of the Zoom platform, podcast platform, web hosting, and administrative costs. To contribute, you can go to rico12.com forward slash support, or you can click the link to PayPal in the chat of the live meeting or in the show notes of the podcast. When you contribute, please specify the meeting number. This is meeting number 32. Last week's meeting and follow-up Q&A were with David A. His topic was primary and secondary addictions and God. There were some really good things in, the, in those meetings. And if you haven't heard them yet, I invite you to check them out after listening to this meeting with David H. If you have also found value in RICO 12, please take a moment to go to your podcast platform and leave a rating and review. It helps us work our 12th step by carrying the message of recovery to more addicts who suffer. Now, one more word about our speakers before we introduce today's speaker. When we line up a speaker for a meeting, we try to ask them to seek guidance on what and how to present so that they can reflect the light they have been given. That light will hopefully inspire hope, meaning, worth, and growth in each of us, the, li the listening audience. Now, let's introduce to, uh, the guest speaker for today, David H., who will be speaking to us on the topic of the integrated life, embracing the shadows, and making peace with our shame. I'm really excited about this topic. Here's a little about David H. David is a person who moved to Nashville with two songwriting deals, the author of two books, and now a certified professional recovery coach in private practice in the greater Nashville area. Also the co-host of the Positive Sobriety Podcast, which, by the way, is a fantastic podcast for us addicts. It's really a fantastic podcast for anybody. Go and check it out. I invite you to do that. David is a part of the St. Augustine's Episcopal Chapel Recovery Eucharist, the Samson Society, and a couple of private recovery meetings in the greater Nashville area. David, the floor is yours. Take it away. Well, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here. And um, thank you all for uh, your patience and time and uh, trust <laughs> to uh, sit and hear uh, my thoughts on this. And um, so I just, I'd like to start out just by saying I got sober in 2005 uh, by God's uh, patience. <laughs> and um, I thought that when I went into recovery, I and began to explore uh, what recovery was going to look like after I got over the illusion that I was really just going to 12 step meetings to see if there was one more way to manage my drinking. Um, you know, cause I really didn't want to quit like most of us until I just realized that maybe that wasn't, that there wasn't a plan A and a plan B version of this, that there was really just do it. Um, but once I got beyond that, um, I thought that recovery for me was going to be how, okay, so tell me how I don't drink. Tell me how I don't act out. Tell, how, tell me how I don't use, um, and I'll follow your pattern and your plan and I'll be dutiful and you give me a list of things not to do and how I can avoid doing them and I'll do it. And so um, shortly after I got into the program, I met a sponsor that a man who eventually became my sponsor for several years and uh, my first sponsor. And um, he was a he was a no BS guy and he cut right to the chase 
And uh, he worked in uh, PR here in the greater Nashville area. He did a lot of political uh, stuff. So he was very, um, he had a very tuned meter, you know, when people were trying to uh, snow him, which I thought I was pretty good at until I met <laughs> other addicts and other alcoholics and other people in recovery. And um, I told him, he said, he said, do you want to be sober? The first thing when I met him, he said, do you want to be sober? And I said, well, yeah, I, I want to know how not to drink. And he said, well, that's not what I asked you. He said, I want to know if you want to be sober. And I said, I don't think I know the difference. And he said, well, he said, if you just want to not drink, I can't help you. But if you want to be sober, I can. And he said, what is going to happen if we, if we want to be sober is we're going to explore every single aspect of your life. And he said, we're going to put everything from God on down out on the table and we're going to look at it and we're going to take it apart. And we're going to do this kind of a um, emotional autopsy on your life and what you believe and what you value and what you think and what your narrative is that you tell yourself and all this stuff. And some of it will make it back and some of it won't. And, um, and that's okay. Cause some of it doesn't belong here now anyway, which is probably why you drink like you do among other reasons. And <clears throat> so he said, some of it's going to make the trip and some of it's not, but at the end of the day, you'll be a whole version of yourself that you can embrace and trust and present to the world uh, with confidence and without shame. And I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> that just seemed like, um, you know, well, okay, if you're going to create the perfect world scenario for me, sure, let's do it. But, but it also was really scary because what I discovered is that sobriety and recovery is probably one of the most disruptive experiences I've ever had in my whole life. Um, I thought I was going to go in and I was going to learn to behave better so people would be nicer to me <laughs> and I would um, earn their trust back and we would all go skipping through tulips holding hands um, and I would get a parade at the end of the day on my first sobriety anniversary, which nobody freaking remembered, by the way. <laughs> um, nobody uh, gave me a cupcake or anything because, you know, anyway, that's a whole other story. But, you know, I, I remember, um, you know, saying, gosh, does anybody know what today is? And they were like, well, I think it's Tuesday, you know. And I'm, no, it's one year. Oh, good for you. Um, thanks. And, uh, you know, because people in my life were kind of they're kind of toasted you know, and, and they were still in the perspective of why would we give you a parade for stopping doing something you shouldn't have been doing in the first place? Cause they still had a lot of ideas about this all being about behavior too. And so, um, so I started working with my sponsor and I began that process. And what I learned, um, later was that the work we were doing very much paralleled the way that I was trained to approach clients in my um, coaching certification program, because we, um, in some ways, explored the work of Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist um, who's big in behavioral health. And so being in practice with working with addicted people, it's really important to know what Jung referred to as the shadow self. And I used to think of the shadow as the bad part of me, you know, uh, the part that uh, there was good David and bad David. And I had to keep a lid on bad David and I could take good David certain places, but bad David had to stay home because he tended to act up and um, he wasn't safe. Um, but what I learned about the shadow is that the shadow is really just the, the parts of me where um, I am conflicted. I'm conflicted about something maybe that I think I believe that I really don't, something that I say I value, but my behavior doesn't demonstrate that I do. Um, my shame for the way I did treat people, my shame for the things I feel, my shame over sexuality, my shame over the way that I interact, the way I manipulate. But the shadow is the part of us that is there and it's true and we have to embrace the shadow and we have to acknowledge the shadow so that um, we can integrate because the object isn't to kill the shadow self or to kill those parts of ourselves that we don't like. 
it is to um, integrate all of it into one human being that can go out, like my sponsor said, and live an integrated self without shame and, and excuse making. And I found that to be really, um, you know, it, it's a challenging lifelong process, of course, but it's very freeing because what I discovered in my recovery was without anesthesia, I could see very clearly that there were parts of me that were very compartmentalized. And I had a lot of personas. I had the persona that I could take out here and, and do this job. I had a persona that um, I showed up with in my family. I had persona that I showed up with in my faith system at the time. I had a persona that um, could take me into the places that were not so glamorous that I wasn't proud of. Um, but that persona gave me permission to do certain things. That persona was kind of a victim and, um, the victim thrived on resentment. The victim, um, could use resentment as a means by which he, um, gave himself permission. So the victim with a sense of entitlement is a dangerous person. You know, um, because if I believe that I'm a victim and if I'm living in this resentful place where I have been wronged and I have been um, this and this and this by people, and I use that as a place to stay stuck as if life is just happening to me um, and I'm not empowered, I'm going to go to the I deserve. And when I get to I deserve my entitlement, that's going to be a dangerous place because that's where I can relapse. That's where I can just act out and be crappy to people and justify it. Um, and it's also a place where I can give that shadow um, its own little compartmental uh, space to exist. When what I have to do, uh, I've learned, is experience the fact that that, that is all part of me. Um, there is part of me that does believe I'm a victim. There is part of me that does feel shame for the things I've done in the past. Um, but rather than try to make those untrue by doing enough good stuff to earn my way out of it, um, I have to embrace the fact that, no, that happened. Um, that was really crappy. That was really bad judgment. That was um, really self-centered fear uh, taking its toll on uh, me and, and me taking it out on everybody else. Uh, but the, but the shadow that I have, um, has to find a place to be true and to be acknowledged and to know that he exists in there so that I can spot him when he shows up. Because if I just deny his existence, then I'm going to live in this place of believing that only the good me is the one that counts. And the other part of me is one that I just have to keep tapped down and try to keep him, you know, uh, away from the windows. Um, and, and that's a, a scary place to live because if I do that enough, it's emotionally exhausting and I'm going to want a way to numb out from that because I'm going to be very, very exhausted. Um, one of the places this all showed up uh, for me was um, ironically, in my uh, real active alcoholism, I was on staff at a church, <laughs> at a pretty conservative uh, church, um, not a fundamentalist church, but a, a conservative Presbyterian church. And um, I got sober and began to hear things that I suddenly questioned. And I suddenly wondered if I really believed. Um, and over time, and, and I spent time with monks and retreats and spiritual guides. And I went way outside the box for conservative Presbyterians to find my spiritual path and uh, realized I was probably a better Christian Buddhist than I was an evangelical. <laughs> and so um, that creates a problem when you're on the pay payroll. And uh, But what I had to do was I had to embrace the fact that I don't altogether believe what I'm selling. And then I have to decide if I'm in the best place to be selling that. Um, and, and so if I'm questioning a lot of things and trying to make them fit, like, you know, the Cinderella slipper, so to speak, I'm going to be in, um, perpetual conflict. I'm going to feel disingenuous. I'm going to feel, um, at times like, um, I'm not being an authentic version of myself. And so it took a lot of, um, acknowledging hard things for me to come to a place where I realized that um, that part of myself in order to be integrated was going to have to change because I couldn't, I couldn't continue to say, well, 
I know, but I need the insurance. I need the paycheck. Um, it, it just didn't feel whole to me. So that part of myself had to go into a place where I'm like, you know, this was true for me for a while. And now I'm realizing this isn't true. And I do believe in faith communities. So I found a faith community where I do feel like I can embrace uh, more broadly um, a belief system that is consistent with who I am. And, um, but those are the kind of things that had to change. We, um, we say that we have um, certain uh, things that we value, but yet our shadow lives in an antithetical way. And so rather than going to shame and saying, well, you should feel better about this. You should treat people this way. You should not have said that. I can go to a place and ask myself, okay, I'm seeing this coming up. Where is it coming from? Because what is happening is when you start embracing the shadow, you give it permission to be true. So you have to name it and it's real. And then we have to deal with it. Um, But you can also begin to spot the things that the shadow can cause um, the things about the shadow that um, are are false, false messages that the shadow can bring you. And so we have to integrate all of that and realize that this is all part of me. This is all part of my fear. Um, there's part of me that's pretty semi well adjusted. And there's part of me that's a nine year old neurotic Baptist kid that's still trying to get to heaven you know, (laughs) or a scared, um, you know, 60 year old man who wakes up every day wondering if, uh, you know, clients will come back and I have to resist manipulation in order to stay in business or, you know, those are fears, but I can spot those fears as a more integrated self without it um, taking me to a place of shame. Because I can look at that and I can go, well, you know what, you're you're imposing some real self-centered fear on that situation. Um, that's coming from this. That's coming from that. Um, and you need to step back from that. You need to look at what your motives were in that. And if you owe apologies and amends, you can jump right in on them. I think that the working the shadow work, which is what we would call it, um, is very consistent with 12-step recovery because you're constantly in a place of working step uh, step work out as you go back and say, you know, do I, do I need to go back and, and make amends for some things? Do I need to, do I need to take a closer look to at that? Is this me not, um, living in a surrendered mindset? Is this me believing that somehow the shadow's convincing me again, that I need to be in control? Um, one of the things we know about addiction, about substance use disorder, about compulsive unwanted behaviors is that there typically is a four-legged stool that supports them. And in in recovery work, one of the things we do is we try to identify what the trauma, the shame, the anxiety, and the isolation are in a a subject's life. Um, Because trauma, shame, anxiety, and isolation are going to drive addictive behavior. They're going to cause us to want to numb out. Um, part of shadow work is getting in touch with the trauma that maybe we experienced um, earlier in our lives. For a lot of people, um, you know, we, they hear the word trauma and they think, well, you know, I've never run through a minefield in Kuwait. I don't have trauma. You know, I wasn't beaten as a kid. I don't have trauma. Um, But that might be big T trauma, but we're talking about any time you felt alone in your pain. That's really any time you, you did not have an empathetic witness to your pain, um, that's what we would call trauma because you were alone and you weren't assured and you felt like you had to work this out on your own. This was all for you to fix and that no one cared enough to hear or to experience your pain with you or to acknowledge that your pain was real. And one of the things, again, with the shadow, that when we embrace that shadow, we have to look at it for what it is and call it what it is and say, you know, this is real. This really happened. This may not have been um, anyone's ill will, but this is how I experienced it. And then we begin to make peace with that. And that can take the shame away because rather than you saying to yourself, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Your parents were well-meaning. You shouldn't feel that way. They didn't, you know, mean any ill will when they said this or when this happened to you in a relationship or whatever. Um, th- that may be, but but what I know is this is what happened to me and this is how I experienced it. And I can go to that place and integrate that without, without shame. 
Um, one of the things that we do when we're not willing to embrace the shadow is we isolate and we begin to live apart from community, which is antithetical to any good recovery program. We have to have community and we have to have people around us to, um, to support us and that we have the opportunity to extend love and grace to as well, because that's how we also stay sober. But but we will isolate if we're not willing to look at the shadow because we'll hide. You know, the first thing we'll do when we're found out or when we're feeling vulnerable is we will go to fear and we will hide. So we want to we want to eliminate the opportunity for the isolation. Anxiety is a huge part of our um, is of our the roots of our addiction. I don't know how many of us always say I would um, drink because I was anxious or I would drink because I can't go to sleep. Um, that may be true on a certain level, but what is really happening is you've got an amygdala in your brain that is stuck in fight, flight, or freeze for a bunch of reasons. You know, if you see a bear in the woods, the amygdala is the part of your brain that tells you run like hell and you should listen. Um, it's saving your life. It has a role. It has an appropriate purpose. But when I'm in the woods and I only feel like there might be a bear, or I suspect that I'm feeling really alone and gosh, what if there were a bear? That's called anxiety. And the amygdala is sending you false messages. And it's stuck in this place of reminding you over lots and lots of time um, and, and habitual practices that you're in danger when you in fact maybe are not. And so we have to begin to look at what is true, what is real, what do I really know about the situation, and where in my shadow self is that coming from? What experience do I need to identify again and embrace so that I'm not feeling shame about my anxiety, but I'm identifying it purposely and practically so that I don't go to this place of should in myself and live out of a place of shame. Um, and again, you know, going, going to shame, that is a quick route back to me believing for a minute that maybe I need something to help me um, medicate that shame. Maybe I need a place to get off of the ride here for a little while and just check out. And, uh, and maybe a drink wouldn't be a bad idea. Maybe I could do it differently this time. And we have to get in touch with those voices that, that exist in the shadow that, that are afraid of change because your brain's responsibility is homeostasis. The brain feels safe when it keeps everything the same. That's why we stay in bad situations as long as we do, because the fear of change is always greater than the pain we're in. And when the pain is greater than the fear of change, then we make a change. And But we have to be in touch with that shadow self in order to um, identify again what is true what are the messages that are coming from me and what are the messages that are just coming from my past? So when we begin to integrate the self, the whole self, our past, our, our history, our story, even though we all have stories that we shudder when we have to think about them, when we go through those snapshots in our heads of the way some nights were spent and some mornings, um, it's, it's hard, but that is all part of who we are. And I am able to finally Um, feel like one integrated person that I can take anywhere. And I don't apologize for my experiences and I don't apologize for my opinions. I don't apologize for the parts of me that um, just are the way I am. And I don't mean that in a, in a glib, take it or leave it way um, that I don't, um, that I'm insensitive to people, but that it's simply that I don't feel like I have to create a persona to take anywhere. That compartmentalized living is diffused And I don't have to just, um, I don't have to look for the person that I can take to church and look for the person I can take to work and look for the person that I can go into relationships with because they're all one person. They can, they can be rolled into one. The stories are the stories. The history is the history. I am who I am. I'm a grateful recovering person who um, deals with a lot of self-centered fear and has to constantly have a conversation with those those entities in my head to avoid the trauma, shame, anxiety, and isolation that I experience in my daily life. Um, because what I've learned is those things aren't going to go away, but they but I do have the ability to manage them, and I do have the ability to speak into them. So that's kind of my my spiel, <laughs> very very condensed spiel on uh, the shadow and uh, making peace with those shadows and making peace with our shame and integrating, living an integrated life 
where you are one whole progressively healthy person that has given yourself permission to be true and honest with yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. I, I, I really, really like this topic and I love the way that you went into it. Thank you for, for sharing that experience, strength and hope in that. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking about 60 seconds right now and sharing a little bit about the fellowship or fellowships you belong to and how they help you in your own walk uh, right now in recovery, that would be fantastic. Yeah, um, I attend a couple of things, but um, one of the primary things that I really love is the St. Augustine's Recovery Eucharist, which is just a special uh, meeting of recovering people from within uh, the Episcopal Church that I belong to. And um, we meet, uh, I'm in the greater Nashville area, we meet on Vanderbilt's campus in a chapel. uh, And it's really like a 12-step meeting in that we... um, we have some things we read together. We have some things we share, and then we go around and, and everybody has a chance who wants to, uh, to share where they are, how the topic of the day resonates with them. And then we share in a spiritual practice of the Eucharist, because that's part of my faith system. Um, but it's a very spiritual connection with God and with people and with God showing up in the form of other people. Um, and, and that's very important to me. So it, it gives me a tremendous amount of um, personal connection. We've had to do that virtually because of COVID for the last mm, how many months, eight months, nine months or forever, it feels like. Um, and we miss one another, but um, we're still able to stay in touch. So that that's a but it's a beautiful experience. Thank you so much. So uh, it sounds like a fantastic fellowship to to, to, to be involved in. And I hope that, uh, well, it sounds like it helps you and helps lots of other people. And that's a great thing. Very good. So now is the time, uh, to start the Q and a section here. It's time for David to answer your questions. Um, I have written down several and we'll get to as many that come in through the Q and a link at the bottom of your zoom window as possible during the next 20 to 25 minutes as we go through this. So a reminder, if you're here live, type that question in the Q&A link at the bottom and I'll, I'll, we'll get to it. Um, I want to start off with something you, uh, you introduced pretty early in your, in your talk here, David. Um, you talked about um, how the, the beginnings of your sobriety and recovery were kind of disruptive and not soup. There, there was a lot of turmoil going on in that. Why do you think that is the case for so many people first starting in the recovery path? Well, um, I think that it's largely because um, let's take relationships, for instance. I think that we have trained people how to treat us in our addiction. Uh, we have people around us that we have trained how to manage us, manipulate us, uh, do for us, make excuses for us, whatever it is. Um, and they get used to that role. And, and in some cases, they, maybe they even need that role. Maybe it's part of their pathology that they need to be um, in charge. And that's a great excuse they have is to take care of you, you know. Um, but what happens in recovery and sobriety is that we don't want those enablers anymore. We don't want those um, people to uh, handle everything anymore. We have opinions and we have thoughts and we have um, ways that we want to take charge of our own life and take responsibility for things. And suddenly we hear something coming, coming out at us from someone and we think, when did it get to be okay for that person to talk to me like that? When did it get to be okay for me to accept this from this person? Or when did it get to be okay for me to uh, buy into this kind of manipulation from someone? And and what happens is it, it we needed it in our addiction and, and we didn't even really spot it when we were using and acting acting out because um, that was just, we accepted it. Our shame allowed us to take it in. I think we're as addicted to our shame as we are our substances. You know, I really do. I really think that um, addiction and shame are so tied to one another that um, if we don't address our shame uh, in our recovery, we're, we're missing a big chunk, you know, for sure. So I think it, I think honestly, it really, um, is so disruptive because we change and the people around us didn't. 
<laughs> and maybe didn't didn't feel the need to, you know. And then we're coming in going, whoa, 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 and changing the game on all these people. And it's in a way, it's a little unfair to them, but um, it's it's our path to health. So yeah, I like that. Uh, you know, I I've experienced that also in my own life where and and my wife actually for many years before I experienced it, she she got into her healing and recovery many years before me. And I can just imagine the the frustration she had with people in her life still going about things because I I've experienced it too. Mm. Um you talked about many personas and I totally identify with that. I have the the dad mask, the husband mask, the church mask, the the work mask, whatever it may be persona. And you talked a little bit about the, uh, the, I did deserve persona. How do you keep the, I deserve persona in check or identify it and move through it without, um, it taking over? Cause that's a big one that entitlement I deserve thing. Well, for me, when I get to that place of enough resentment that I deserve, uh, you know, whatever, I have to think about what that's, what I'm really saying to myself, because often the thing I think I deserve is really um, some type of self self loathing behavior. You know, uh, at the end of the day, it's not because I deserve you know a trip to the beach or I deserve you know a a, a great new car. I mean, maybe I maybe I think that at, at times, and and that my entitlement has played into some of those decisions. But um, but typically it's, it's going to take me to, I deserve to drink like I want to, or like I thought I wanted to, and I deserve to act out in this way because that would, that would give me, um, a release here. And, um, the reality is, is that I'm looking for a way to go back to my shame and hurt myself. And that's really what we're saying, even though we don't, think it's disguised as reward, but it's really something that's going to take you, if you follow the long tail all the way out, it's going to take you back to another self-loathing behavior. And so you have to really say, do I really deserve this? Or am I just looking for an excuse to return to the safety of my shame and self-loathing? So I have excuses for what I'm not doing and accomplishing in my life. Thank you. Um, I also, um, grew up in and continue to be part of a, a fairly conservative um, religious tradition, faith tradition, that at least my perception was I was taught to always suppress that shadow, keep it hidden, keep it out of the wi- windows, as you said. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and as I have come to ign- recognize that I need to embrace and integrate a lot of that shadow, if not all of it, I'm still fighting with some of those things of embracing but um, it's it's really freed me and 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 really actually opened up my my mind and heart to additional truths that whether I heard or not I never whether they were taught or not I never heard them that way. What is your experience in in the struggles of really integrating this the the shadow in a faith based? system. And I know you talked a little bit about that, but I'd like to dig a little bit deeper if you don't mind. Yeah, boy, I could, <laughs> I could spend a whole, uh, you know, another 30 minutes on that. Um, I, well, I'll, I'll tell you in my experience as a kid, um, I was always told, you know, don't, um, don't do these things or these things or these things because it will hurt your witness. You know, that was the that was the terminology that was used in in my background was it'll hurt your witness. Um, What I really grew to later in my life, believe and learn is that um, is that that what that's really saying is that it will hurt your persona, (laughs) you know, um, and people might be conflicted because what will they think if if you say you profess this, but you engage in that, you know, in my personal life now, I believe, um, that, uh, that, that witness term doesn't mean what I thought it did. You know, um, it's, it's really asking me to maintain a level of, um, a a veneer of performance, whether it's actually authentic or not, because it makes other people feel better. And, um, so don't ask your questions. Don't, complicate the system with, you know, your views on wondering about this or this, 
um, because that that's going to look really conflicted and it's bad for business, you know? Um, so I, I'm trying not to be, um, you know, cynical about it because I really am, I'm really trying to heal in that area as well in, in the past. But, but I do believe that faith systems are performance driven many, many times. And one of the things we learn in recovery is that if we are just performing for people, we are in bad shape, you know, and um, we're on a slippery slope. And I am much more uh, of the opinion that people embrace your authentic questioning and your authentic um, struggles uh, than they do your perfection. Perfection alienates people. I don't know how to deal with it. You put me off. You make me uncomfortable because you're so damn good. I can't be around you, you know, and I'm like, I don't know. I have a lot more freedom uh, by telling people this is where I struggle. This is where I've been. Uh, this is why I don't drink anymore um, and letting the chips fall, you know, um, because a, it frees me not to have so much to maintain and B, um, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't have the criteria for sainthood, so I don't, I don't even want the job. (laughs) Awesome. I love that. I don't have the criteria for sainthood. Why would I even want it? That's, that's awesome. Um, I want to share a little bit of my experience with, with what we just, what you just talked about that question there. Um, like I mentioned, I grew up in a conservative faith-based uh, community um, where, you know, performance was it. At least my perception of it was image was more important than what was underneath the image. Over the last handful of years, as I've gotten into recovery and done more of this shadow work and acknowledging that, um, I have found even in honest questioning, that honest and changing of perception and perspective um, I now find I do many of those things that I did before out of fear or whatever, but I do them now and it's definitely not out of fear and it's not to show people, it's not to put on that veneer, that false front. Mm-hmm. Um, is that your experience also? You do a lot of those things now because maybe it works or maybe you find that there's value in it rather than just to show a good, put on a good show. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. And I think a lot of it came from, um, learning to live out of a place of gratitude. Um, You know, I I think where, where desperation and gratitude intersect is where worship happens. Um, And, and so if I am keenly aware of my shadow and I'm desperate to be in a faith community, um, excuse me, and I'm grateful as I'll get out for the gift of, um, a life that doesn't include trying to remember what I did last night and, you know, where I left my shoes and, <laughs> and those, that's the least of it, but, you know, we'll, we'll stop with that. Um, I am extremely more, uh, able to embrace the, the reality of, of, uh, authentic spiritual practices So they're not just rote exercises anymore. They're actually an extension of my gratitude and an acknowledgement of my desperation. So again, it's an integrated practice for me. And and like you're experiencing, it doesn't feel like rote exercises that are, um, you know, I got to do this to be good or to look good or to not piss God off. You know, I've got to, um, I'm actually in a place where I can look at it and go, man, I'm desperate to be here and I'm grateful that I can be. So yeah, this doesn't feel like, um, work. I'm, I'm, I'm buying in to the parts of this that are real for me, uh, with a whole heart. Oh, that line where desperation and gratitude meet, that's where worship happens. That is, that is awesome. Um, if you just came up with that now, that's awesome. If you've heard <laughs> other places, that's still awesome, but no, that is a beautiful, beautiful statement. I think I'm going to live by that one. Um, Another question I have, and a reminder to our live audience, if you have any questions, type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of the window. Um, we'll get to those here. But I've got another question here about the small t trauma. You know, we talked. you talked a little bit about capital T and small t trauma. That small t trauma happens with so many of us almost every day. Um, mm-hmm. how, 
how can a person move through that in real time? Yes, I can look back and see the small T trauma in my past, but when I when I'm confronted with it in my daily life, how how do you move past and through that? Well, that's a good question because I think that sometimes um, we don't know that we've been traumatized until after the fact. You know, it's wonderful if we have the luxury in the moment to say, wait a minute, I'm I'm not feeling connected with you and I'm not feeling heard because I just told you exactly how I'm experiencing you right now and you gave me no feedback. You know, um, that's great if you have the in the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, the thing to, you know, to say to that and to call out and the and the presence of mind uh, to say that, that this is causing me to feel really abandoned. I feel really alone, you know, even though there are two of us here, I'm feeling really alone in this. Um, but sometimes we get away from the experience and we start to ruminate, <clears throat> pardon me. And, um, and the ruminating is, I think where we get into dangerous places because that's where we begin to tell ourselves our narrative, you know, whatever that narrative is in our world, in our lives that we put everything through that filter where, you know, I'm not lovable. I'm not worth relating to. I'm this, I'm this. Um, and that shame starts to, to creep in. So, um, I, I have to work really hard at making sure the things I'm telling myself are rooted in truth and rooted in fact. Um, because what I'm experiencing is maybe small T trauma is not intentional on the behalf of the people that maybe I'm attaching to that. Um, but I have to be really in touch with, um, is what I'm telling myself true? Am I putting it through my shame narrative and, um, coming up again with, you know, a reason why, um, the, the old messages are wanting to, wanting to come through. Thank you. I appreciate that, David. For you, I mean, you talked a lot about integration, integration of all the different parts, the shadow with the self and the different personas and everything. Um, and I believe that's an ongoing process that goes on for our whole lives, but maybe not. Um, tell me a little bit about that process when you started to really feel more integrated and, and, and tell me a little bit more about how long it took in going through that until you kind of feel more of a whole type person. Well, I don't think that I really um, knew how numbed out I was and how anesthetized I was um, until I'd been sober about three months um, I really don't think I knew how, how dead I was to offense and opinions and, um, things that I heard that, um, didn't connect with me, you know, that just using those again as examples, but, um, I began to realize as I gave myself permission to feel. And as I gave myself permission to think, and as I gave myself permission to explore, um, gosh, I don't, I don't think I resonate with that. Um, what would happen if I said so, you know, and it was sort of like, you know, uh, you know, the, the deer teetering out on the thin ice, you know, he wobbly legs and all kind of goes out there to see how far he can get before the ice breaks, you know, and, and it hits the fan and, and you're, and you're, uh, suddenly in conflict or something, but, but I, I just began to feel like I'm suddenly aware of things. I just suddenly knew things. I just suddenly realized things because I wasn't all foggy and clouded and preoccupied and, um, only thinking about when I could drink again, you know? Um, and as people and situations and relationships began to emerge in my life, I began to see that some of them were really healthy and valuable and some of them were real transactional. You know, I had some relationships in my life where people were just um, either using me as a means to an end and I hadn't seen it before, or I was using people and I didn't care about them. I just cared about what they could do for me, you know, and that became really unflattering. And uh, when you become aware of that um, in your personal life, but those things began to emerge just as I began to get healthier and healthier. And then as I began to speak my truth, and then I began to feel um, secure in the fact that I'm not, I'm not trying to be right. I'm just trying to be heard. You know, I'm not even really that concerned about being right. I just want to be heard. 
Um, I want to be known and I want to be loved. And I'm not, I'm not here to say that I've got it all figured out, but I do know that this is how I'm experiencing it. And so as you begin to give yourself permission a little bit at a time to wobble out on the thin ice, then I think it begins to get a little bit easier, but you begin to realize that the world didn't come to an end because you offended somebody or the world didn't become, uh, you know, a terrible place because you disappointed someone, you know, and, uh, and I, I had a terrible time with uh, the idea that I might disappoint people for a long time, you know, performing and not disappointing people was tantamount to, you know, being a great human being. And, um, and sometimes I can't afford to be a great human being. <laughs> so I found when I ask those questions in a, it, well, it depends on the, the setting, but, you know, I, I'll have those questions of, hmm, is it safe to ask this question? Because I really have this whether it be a doubt, whether it be just a concern, whatever. Um, I found that most times when I ask those questions, um, the response is more of a um, acceptance rather than a, hey, get out of my face. Have you had that experience too? Yes. And I learned that um, early on how to, how to, um, uh, gosh, how to soften some of my contentious uh, <clears throat> excuse me, tones to the questions that I did have, you know, um, to be in a staff meeting and, and to say, you know, when in the hell did we start believing that? <laughs> it's probably not the way to uh, approach it. I learned that actually. Um, but uh, you, you learn, you know, help me understand uh, what are we saying when we say this? That's a better way to ask that question. But, uh, you know, yeah, I think people are more uh, accepting than we think they're going to be, for sure. Um, but I think we've told ourselves for a long time that the truth isn't welcome and, and we, uh, we run from it. If there's no other questions from the audience, uh, I have one more, but the audience can chime in here. Um, and then we'll start wrapping things up. Now, David, you talked a lot about doing shadow work in this conversation. And a lot of it... Um, sounded like something similar to inner child work. Is there, is there some between shadow work and inner child work? And if so, if not, what are the differences and, and what type of, um, is there value to both of them? Well, I think in many ways they share a lot of similar things because I think the inner child is part of the shadow. You know, uh, the inner child is that part of us. Like I said before, there is a nine-year-old Baptist kid in my head every now and then that wants to drive the bus because I really scare him, you know. <laughs> and um, but I think that uh, there is a there are a lot of overlaps there. Now, uh, you know, when we get into trauma therapy and things where people have, you know, big T trauma and, and childhood trauma and things that are really uh, significant. I think you need a, a real trauma therapist to take you through that process. Um, there are a lot of, you know, great modalities that can, um, you know, help you with memory and, um, and accepting things and not just being re-traumatized by the shadow work, so to speak, you know, because some of that we have to be really careful because it can re-traumatize people uh, that have, that have significant trauma in their lives to sit there and um, wander into places that without help and without a guide, you know, to take them. And I, so I think that'd be a great question for, you know, somebody in, in real deep psychiatric, uh, practice to, to answer better than, than I just did, but that's, that's what I know. So. Very good. I appreciate you being willing to step into that just a little bit, but, uh, and also give the advice to, that's what one wants to do to seek qualified help because yeah, it, I, I understand that it can be pretty uh, dangerous to wander in those places alone. Yeah. Very good. So David, I really appreciate this. Um, before we close up, do you have any other words of wisdom or if you would like, you can share a little bit about how you mentioned that you've written a couple books and a podcast. If you wouldn't, if you want to share a little bit about how to find that, you're free well, to do so. Yeah, I appreciate again, you know, the opportunity to be here with everybody. And um, so thank you so much. Um, but uh, I would just continue to say, be honest with yourself first, um, or you'll never be able to be honest with anybody else. You know, uh, typically, most of the time, we're not lying to other people, we're lying to ourselves. And when we can tell ourselves the truth, then we can risk telling other people the truth. Um, uh, I have a couple of books. One is, uh, something that's sort of a faith-based 
40-day recovery journal. It's called Our Authentic Selves, Reflections on What We Believe and What We Wish We Believed. And it's a little bit about unpacking the difference between uh, things we think we think and things we wish we think um, or wish we thought. And um, so that's available on Amazon is among other places. But um, also uh, my most recent book is called After the Miracle, Reflections, uh, no, Illusions Along the Path to Restoration. And it's really about uh, my own journey, but it's about the disruption of sobriety, basically. Um, After the Miracle, Illusions Along the Path to Restoration, that's also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Um, I do have the, as you mentioned, Positive Sobriety podcast. Um, We are on Apple Podcasts and Podbean and um, most anywhere that you can subscribe to podcasts, uh, you can find us. And uh, we've got about 80 some episodes under our belt now. And we have a wide variety of guests. Uh, we don't we don't come from any one perspective on recovery or faith or uh, any of that. It's a very um, uh, eclectic audience. So uh, you might check that out. It's been a lot of fun. Nate Larkin, uh, a fellow recovering friend of mine, and I uh, co-host that. And um, then uh, I'm in private practice in Nashville. If you want to go to my website and learn a little more of my story, it's David Hampton CPRC, which just stands for Certified Professional Recovery Coach. And it's David Hampton CPRC.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. I'll get those um, items in, in the show notes. So if anybody wants to check those out, they can find the links there in the show notes. Thanks again, David. That was a great RICO 12 speaker meeting for all addicts and those wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom. If you have any other questions, please go to www.rico12.com forward slash forum and join in our community to ask those questions or others questions that will come up. I invite the audience to come back next week. If you've not yet gone to Rico12.com and submitted your email address, you only need to do it once. Please go get on the invitation list so you can join us live each Friday at noon central time. Now, David has chosen to have me lead us out of this meeting and to lead us into the rest of this day with the serenity prayer. And I'll go ahead and do that now. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Thy will, not mine, be done. Amen. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. So work it. You are worth it. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Reflecting on the landscape of this life of mine.